Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at choosewood.com. This is St. Louis on the Air. I'm Jonathan All, in for Sarah Fenske. For many people in the St. Louis region, it's taken more than 10 days for them to receive COVID-19 test results. The delay in results has caused headaches for business owners trying to reopen and uncertainty for people deciding whether or not to quarantine and for how long. The incident commander of the St. Louis Metropolitan Pandemic Task Force will join us in a bit to discuss the demand for tests and the reasons for delayed results. But first, we're going to talk to a business owner who calls the testing results lag a major issue for his restaurants. I'd like to invite our listeners into the conversation. If you have a question or comment about this topic, give us a call at 314-382-8255. That's 382-TALK. Or you can send us a tweet at STL on air or email us at talk at stlpublicradio.org. Joining me first to talk about this issue is Aaron Teitelbaum, the order, owner of Herbie's and Kingside Diner. Aaron, welcome to St. Louis on the Air. Thank you for having me, Jonathan. Your restaurants have been open since late May, but earlier this month uh, you got that call that I'm sure every business owner dreads that they tested positive for coronavirus. What did you do next? So we received the call Saturday evening at three or Saturday afternoon at three o'clock. And, and our initial response was um, to close. We, we canceled a, a full, you know, as full as we can be reservation evening, um, called all of our people and, and sent all of our employees to get tested that evening or Sunday morning um, because we just didn't know what to do. And so our initial is to, is to do what we feel is safest. And that's interesting that it was that immediate of a decision because there's a lot of different opinions on on what to do in that kind of situation. It sounds like for you it wasn't a difficult call at all. It wasn't, and it wasn't because we didn't have any direction. Um, and, you know, we've kind of been, we've talked a lot about this um, subject to the news, to other restaurant um, uh, restaurant tours, just because we've kind of been on the leading um, or forward thinking, uh, part of, of COVID we've, we've really kind of handled this first and foremost in all aspects. We were one of the first restaurant groups to close down, um, back in March. And so we've just, you know, we've been taking it as it comes to us. So again, when we get to a spot where we don't know what to do, we err on the side of safety. How long did it take uh, for your employees to get their test results? So our employees, um, again, they went in Saturday or Sunday, and our employees did not start um, to receive any test results for about six days. And there were some that we are just now inviting back, and that's weeks later because they have didn't receive their test results. So it was anywhere from six days up until almost 20 days now. So you had employees that had a test and didn't get their results for 20 days? Close to 20 days, that's correct. Practically speaking, as a business owner, what kind of turnaround do you need um, in in terms of timing to be able to continue to run your business um, in a way that is viable but also safely? So for us, um, we need, we, you know, the 24 hour or the instant read tests we don't, we've been told are not accurate. So for us to do the accurate tests, the ones that we're comfortable reopening our businesses, we need 24 to, I mean, God, 48 on the max end. Um, we've already taken enough hits. Uh, we were, you know, we were closed for 10 days. We need quick turnarounds. We need 24 to 48 hours. Does the, the, the lag, does that challenge your resolve to make the number one priority safety and I mean will it be a more difficult call the next time because you know what kind of delay there might be in testing so it's not a challenge in our safety because that does come first for us no matter what but um, we have you know spoken with uh, some lawyers and insurance companies that handle restaurants and we have come up we've come up with um, recommendations from CDC and other 
um, groups on what we should do because of testing not being readily available. And there's, if somebody is asymptomatic, they're telling us that, you know, that person has to be um, sent home, but we don't have to close down the restaurant. It's if they're in there with symptoms, that is the major um, issue that they're, they're concerned about. You're and then on the top side of that, we also bought a machine to sit, to sanitize the restaurant on a regular basis. Do you think that you have uh, colleagues who own other restaurants in the region that might not have your dedication uh, to safety and might make a different call about what to do because of frustrations over uh, testing delays? I do. And I think that um, I think all of us will get to that spot at some point. You know, this is something that isn't a one time shot for it to happen. You know, there you know, we are um, we are fortunate on where we are today financially. Um, and I like to think that I would make that call all the time. Um, but who knows when you're when you're talking about whether you can feed your family. Aaron Teitelbaum, thanks for joining me today. Aaron is the owner of Herbie's and both Kingside Diner locations. Aaron, best of luck to you. Thank you for having me, Jonathan. Have a great day. Now joining us is Dr. Alex Garza, Chief Medical Officer at SSM Health and Incident Commander of the St. Louis Metropolitan Pandemic Task Force. Again, I'd like to invite your con comments in the conversation. If you have a question or a comment on this topic, you can call us at 314-382-8255. That's 382-TALK. Or you can send us a tweet at STL on air or email us at talk at stlpublicradio.org. Dr. Garza, thanks very much for joining us this afternoon. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. So you heard um, a restaurant owner very frustrated by having delays of 6 to 20 days um, what's your assessment of uh, the speed of tests in the St. Louis region and, and what we can expect going forward? Yes, uh, great question. So it really depends on where the test is sent. And so uh, I am assuming uh, from, from what he said that most of those tests were being sent to one of two really national labs, which is Quest and LabCorp. Um, and as I think many people have seen in the media over the last couple of days that uh, uh, these labs have been inundated uh, because they receive tests from around the country. So not just from the St. Louis metropolitan area, but from places that are hard hit, like Florida, Arizona, California. And they've simply run out of capacity. Um, and so they prioritize uh, whose tests get run first. And so if it's somebody that is being admitted to a hospital or a healthcare worker, um, those tests are going to get run first, and the asymptomatic being screened for exposure are pushed to the back end. And, and you know, you can reasonably understand why, uh, which is why it's taking so long for those tests to get done. Now, if you think about this uh, just from a logistics uh, point of view, whenever you have a fixed capacity of something that you can do, like a test, and then you have a large number of, of orders coming in where you have reached your maximum capacity, then it's going to delay the output, which is the test result. So it's, it's simple logistics. We just don't have the testing capacity to turn them around in a, in a quick amount of time. When I say we, I mean we nationally. Now, the testing that gets done locally is usually for the healthcare systems. And so, for instance, SSM has our, we have our own micro lab uh, where we do that testing for the patients that come into our hospitals, into our emergency departments, things like that. And we have the capacity where we can do those tests in a relatively timely manner so we can turn those test results over in generally 24 hours. Uh, but we have a, a capacity issue as well. So we know how many tests we can run in a 24-hour period. Um, so once we get beyond that, then we start delaying our test results as well. So it's a sheer numbers game is all it is. From a pandemic task force point of view, um, how does the lag on testing and that some of the numbers that you get are from tests that were done yesterday, some of them were, done, were from tests that were done two to three weeks ago, how does that affect the task force's ability to give an accurate picture of the effect of coronavirus and its spread throughout the region? Yeah, well, it certainly um, it, it's concerning and it makes it challenging to then interpret what 
does the what do the case counts mean? So whenever you have that delay, it, it's important to understand that the test how is the test uh, result interpreted? Is it interpreted on the day that the sample was taken, so presumably the day that the person was symptomatic or was exposed, or is it counted on the day that the report was was done, which, as you mentioned, could be anywhere from 6 to 20 days later. So that really wreaks havoc when you're trying to look at trends in cases um, across the metro area, across the state, uh, when you're not really sure if, when your case count is going to go up. So it does put us in a blind um, to understand what is actually going on out in the community on any given day. Now, we do use things like a rolling average that helps to smooth some of that out. Um, but as you can imagine, in a pandemic, you're really wanting to make decisions based on the most timely data that you can have. And if that data is delayed, particularly if, it, if it's delayed a, a couple of weeks, then you're in a lot of trouble because that's another viral replication cycle. So that means more people are getting infected. Um, the other point that, that, I would, that I would say is that it also backs up the work that public health can do. And so by that, I mean if you identify a positive case, then that gets reported to the health department. And then they have a whole chain of events that they need to accomplish, such as contacting the person uh, that did test positive, doing all of the contact tracing, and making sure that they can uh, contact the people that have been potentially exposed to add even more testing onto, onto the demand. So it, it not only backs up our ability to understand what's going on, but operationally it, it puts a burden on public health as well to go out and find more cases so that they can decrease transmission in the community. We have a tweet from a listener who asks, uh, should a restaurant inform the public if they have staff members who tested positive? And obviously that's happening sometime, but is it happening all the time or is it happening enough? Uh, I really don't know the answer to that question, whether they're whether they are informing the public about a COVID uh, positive employee or not. So, and, and I think I would I would leave that between a discussion between public health and the and the restaurant owners. Um, so certainly there are different uh, degrees of exposure um, for people that are positive. And so the rule of thumb that public health goes by is somebody within six feet over 15 minutes of exposure time. So it's distance and it's time because that increases probability of transmission. And so there's a, a lot of work that goes into that contact tracing to understand who has truly had an exposure and who has not. And that's how they make their determinations on who should get tested and who shouldn't. And so in listening um, to, uh, to Aaron um, talking about, well, wasn't sure who should get tested and who should not, and so sent everybody to get testing, um, it, may have, if, it may be that not everybody needed to get tested and only a certain group needed to get tested because they were in close proximity. Um, but as far as the, whether restaurants should announce, hey, somebody has tested positive, um, you know, I think you need to be a little bit more discreet than that because that could be a really broad then group of people um, that could be left with questions um, that would be difficult to answer. Along those lines, Dave on Twitter asks, uh, given both testing delays and the possibility of low-level or asymptomatic uh, people, especially among younger people and young adults, what should young people, what, what should they do when they have symptoms? Well, they should follow um, along the, the guidance um, that CDC has put out and that other, you know, healthcare systems have put out. So if symptomatic, should go and get tested. And so those are probably the easier group to figure out. So if you have symptoms consistent with COVID, doesn't matter what your age is, um, th then you should be advised, to, you know, of course, go through your healthcare provider. Um, but, but if it's consistent, then, then get tested. Um, but the but the questioner's um, question about the asymptomatic is is the difficult one because then it could be presumably anybody uh, that that is without symptoms that could be a spreader. Now those those aren't um, huge percentages. Some studies say like 30 percent, 
um, is typically the younger population. But those are really um, difficult to then identify in the population unless they had some exposure. That's why they're getting tested, things like that. But let me bring that then back to a, a pre preventative issue, which is that's why we advocate wearing masks in public because you don't know who those asymptomatic spreaders are, and that would prevent then transmission to other people uh, who, who were in close proximity to a person like that. Considering testing delays and considering just how many more tests are being performed now than four, eight, mm -hmm. 12 weeks ago, um, I, I'm wondering, is hospitalization count a more accurate depiction of the spread of this and how severe it is and how it's affecting our community than just the case number. It, it, it feels like that's a little more apples to apples if we talk about hospitalizations now compared to, you know, March, com as opposed to looking at total case counts between now and March. Am I, is that an accurate assumption and or question? Yes and no. So, so let me let me explain it a little bit. You're you're right in that it's more of an apples to apples comparison. And so the the reason for that is when we look at hospital admissions, we're looking at patients that have a true diagnosis of COVID. And so there there's not as much guesswork that goes on with that. And then we can define that to the population, such as the St. Louis metropolitan area. And so we know on any given day how many people we're admitting to the hospital that have COVID. And then we can extrapolate that for the population. Um, but all of the pieces that we use to try and present the picture of COVID in the population, each one contributes their piece. And so I don't want to be completely dismissive of case counts because it's obvious that we have increased transmission going on in the community given all of the testing that we have and all of the positive cases coming back. So one of the other pieces that we look at is what we call the percent positive. So of all of the cases uh, or of all of the tests that we've done in the metropolitan area, how many are coming back positive? And that's another barometer that tells us, okay, is there increased circulation in the community or are we holding steady or are we going down? And before we see the admissions, admissions is a, what we call a lagging indicator because it's an end result. But one of the leading indicators is that percent positive, and we did notice that with our most, most recent uptick in cases, that I could look at our lab data and see that percent positive of tests uh, creeping up, and when it continued to creep up, we knew that we were going to now see hospitalizations increasing, you know, give it a week, and then we'll start to see those. So each different data piece plays a part, um, but the, the hospital admissions is, is probably the most definitive piece of data that we have for the, for the reasons I mentioned. One of the biggest concerns and questions is obviously what happens with school in the fall. And I want to play a little bit of Superintendent McCoy from the Jennings School District, who was talking about the importance of uh, rapid testing and, and testing issues in general. Let's hear from the superintendent. Every school needs rapid nasal or swab COVID testing to get results in five minutes uh, at the least or 24 hours at the most so that you don't have to send home droves of kids for checking yes to any of those one symptoms. So it's not until we have that, and that may cost approximately $600 million to occur across the nation for about 100 million, 120 million people coming inside of our schools on a daily basis. But ultimately, those rapid tests will be essential for stability of attendance in school. Now, Dr. Garza, I understand that, that the, the, the task force isn't you know, a policymaking body. It is not a public health organization. But those organizations look to you for better information to make better decisions. In light of the concerns that, like, Superintendent McCoy has, what is your best advice to them at this point on how to handle schools reopening? Yeah, so, so let me address the, the testing question really quickly, and then, then I'll talk a little bit about reopening. So from, from the testing perspective, um, rapid turnaround testing is very scarce right now. Um, so even in the healthcare systems, we have very limited capacity to do rapid test turnaround. And we usually use those for, you know, uh, emergency patients coming in that need to go to the operating room, for example, where we need a really quick diagnosis. 
Um, and there, there's logistics problems with that testing capacity now, and so it, it's it's just not available. So as much as we would like to have rapid testing, um, it, uh, the 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 list, the supply chain is just not there to support that. And so then if you took that and you multiplied it by a, all the school districts, it would quickly outstrip the supply. So so that's one thing. So if you can't do all of that rapid testing, and I'll use like the, the MLB plan as an analogy where they're tested every other day. So if you can't do that in a school system, then it's all about mitigating risk. Um, and so then it comes back to what are those things that we can do to decrease the risk of transmission? And that is mostly what the school districts have been focusing on. Um, so it is all of those evidence-based practices that we've been preaching for, it seems like, well, it has been months on end now. So it's how do I implement social distancing in my school? How do I uh, decrease risk of transmission by wearing face masks and surface decontamination? Those are the big three. And each district is uh, it was a little bit different. Um, depends on the size of the school, how many students are there, um, what the student body makeup is, and and I think people can't forget about uh, you know the the teaching staff and then the support staff as well. Who really, if you think about it, those are the groups that are the highest at risk uh, for transfer for poor outcome if there is transmission in the school. And so you're trying to balance reopening the school with risk mitigation. Um, and that's a challenging thing to do. Um, there's, it's, a, it's a terrific amount of work that has to go into establishing these policies, procedures, and then um, the, the plan and process, if somebody does come in positive, um, is very uh, time and labor intensive as well. And so there is no easy answers to this, and I would say there's no exact right answer to it as well. You know, we're all sort of learning as we're going along with this pandemic. Um, but these general principles are really sort of the guideposts for, for reopening schools. Well, and, and Dr. Garcia, to, to, to finish up here, I, I'd like to end with this. Um, the It just it feels like enough people have decided that despite all of the the discussion of social distancing and masks and cleaning surfaces and all that, enough people have decided that they don't want to follow that or that they won't follow it. Are we to the point of critical mass where, you know, we're just rolling the dice and seeing what happens <laughs> because enough people aren't taking the advice seriously and, and at least doing what we believe right now is our best mitigation opportunities? Um. Yes and, and no. So I think it, uh, you know, it depends um, a lot on where you are, certain communities, um, things like that. Um, so clearly we have uh, mask policy mandates within city and county right now. Um, it, it, we'll, we'll see what the impact of that is. And, and by and large, when when I'm out running errands, things like that, uh, I do notice that uh, most people are adhering to that policy. Um, now, once uh, you know, you you see other communities though that don't have this, and and that's where you um, you see not as much compliance, um, I would say. Um, and so, it, in some instances, uh, you're correct. We are sort of saying, how is this all going to play out? But but I would say that the evidence is there. So um, w there is uh, there's good scientific evidence that says places where mandatory mask wearing has been implemented has shown decrease in cases. It happens in countries, too. Uh, most Asian countries, it's much more acceptable to wear face masks. And we can see from a global perspective that their rates and their able to, the ability to contain the virus are much better um, than countries where it's not as culturally acceptable. So um, in some ways you're right. Uh, I'm hopeful that it won't end up that way, but um, yeah. Dr. Alex Garza is the Chief Medical Officer at SSM Health, and he's also the Incident Commander of the St. Louis Metropolitan Pandemic Task Force. Dr. Garza, thank you very much for spending time with us today. My pleasure, anytime. 
This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com.